Welcome to the Mixology Talk Podcast. I'm Chris. And I'm Julia. And we're the folks behind abarabove.com, the ultimate resource for craft bartenders, bar operators, and just about anybody else looking to make great craft drinks. I'm a bar consultant with more than 10 years of industry experience. And I run abarabove.com, bringing weekly articles and cocktail recipes to help you make great drinks and grow your career behind the bar. This is episode number 120 of the Mixology Talk podcast. And this week we're putting kind of the finishing touches on the bartender to entrepreneur um, episodes that we've been focusing on. And we're going to finish strong. This is probably one of my favorite interviews um, that I've been able to have so far. And our special guest today is going to be Jennifer Kaleo of Small Hand Foods. Um, now I'm going to go ahead and warn you, this is a little bit longer than we usually do um, in the past. But uh, I was going to edit everything down and I started listening to everything and the insights that Jennifer provides during this episode are extremely valuable and very relevant to um, our industry. So I decided to kind of keep everything in. Um, it's about an hour and 15 minutes, so just want to give everyone a heads up. Um, like I said, this is a little bit longer than we usually have, but uh, I hope you agree that it's all worth it. Stay tuned. So thanks for joining us today. Um, today we have a very special guest, uh, Jennifer Calio, and I hope I said that right. That is correct. That is correct. Perfect. <laughs> All right. Beforehand, I just want to give everybody a, a heads up. I actually had to ask her to how to spell, uh, how to say her name because no one, I'm no one, so says, many no one says my name correctly. No one. Oh, so thank you for joining us and uh, definitely appreciate you taking the time to, uh, to be here and, um, you know, share your experiences with our bartending community. Sure thing. You're so welcome. It's my pleasure. Um, so if you don't mind just giving us a brief introduction, kind of obviously who you are, Jennifer Calio, and kind of um, the name of your company and, and just a brief history on your bartending his, uh, experience. Sure. Um, yeah. So I uh, own and operate Small Hand Foods, um, which is a syrup company dedicated to um, pre-prohibition era cocktails and their ingredients. Um, I started it a little over nine years ago while I was tending bar at the Slanted Door in San Francisco. Um, at the time, I was the only, I was the first person to do, to start a company doing this. Uh, at the time, there was companies like Monin and Tarani who are making flavored syrups that people would use, but not syrup specifically for drinks from actual food. So now, of course, there's, um, there's a, a whole genre of products. But at the time, I started making it so that we would have, you know, orgeat made from actual almonds so we could make a Mai Tai the way that it was meant to be made or a Japanese cocktail, or that kind of thing. Um, so let's see, I got started. Um, I went to bartending school when I was 21 and living in Los Angeles. Um, I think like most bartenders of my generation, uh, we tended bar to like bartending was something we did while we did something else. So certainly being in LA, it was, it was, uh, odd that I wasn't, a, you know, a screenwriter or an actor or anything like that. Um, and yeah, I first got this job at um, this place that I had been a regular at called the Irish Times on Motor and National right off the 10. Wonderful, wonderful little family run Irish pub. Um, James and Dolores McGurran run it. And if you go in, tell them I say hello. They're wonderful people. Um, and I had been going there and then um, I ended up getting a job there and I didn't do a very good job. Um, but, <laughs> Not at all. No. I mean, no one had taught me what I'm supposed to do to like properly clean a bar. And then they would be mad at me when it wasn't properly clean, but like no one had taught me, you know? Sure. <laughs> so, um, anyways, one of the regulars there, this guy named Jerry, uh, was a bartender at a fancy, um, Southwestern restaurant on second in La Brea. It was called the Sonora cafe. It's no longer there. Um, but, uh, he said that they were looking for a day bartender. So I, I, at the time, I think I was also an, like an administrative assistant at an architecture firm or something like that. And I was getting pretty bored and annoyed with that job. So, um, I was like, Oh, lunch bartender. sounds great. So I went there. Um, the place was, the place was wonderful. I mean, not, you know, we were, we were close to Paramount. We definitely got a lot of celebrities in, uh, my first shift, first shift training. Leonard Cohen was in there drinking Pernod. Um, Are you serious? Yeah, it was amazing. <laughs> was that like, is. I was like, this is so great. <laughs> oh my god! 
Yeah, that, that must have been like when he was like just blowing up too. I, mean, I don't like, know. I fell in love with Leonard Cohen when I was in high school, which was like the right. 90s. So, uh -huh. you know, and this, well, I guess this was, this would have been 1998. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I was, you know, he's, he had been around and established for quite some time, but sure. it, was, it was pretty incredible. Um, wow. Yeah. So it was great. Um, we had about 80 different tequilas and mezcals, which again, for 1998 was unheard of. There was only one other restaurant in LA that had, um, that had a larger collection than we did. And um, yeah, I mean, I was, a, I was a bartender. I didn't understand anything about execution. Again, you know, going to bartending school, you learn, you learn like the old man drinks that are all, you know, the, the rage now. <laughs> right. But, but for years, every other place that I would work at, I was the person that, that uh, my coworkers would come to me and be like, what's in a rusty nail? What's in a That's Harvey funny. Wallbanger? Cause I can, cause I remember those things. Um, oh yeah, absolutely. So yeah. You know, I, like I, we learned a lot of shit at, at bartending school, but I learned how to free pour really accurately, and I learned and I memorized a ton of drinks. So yeah. um, I do feel like it was valuable. Um, anyways, so at Sonora Cafe, there wasn't a bar manager at the time. There, they had had one, but he had been kind of demoted, but he still worked there. It was pretty awkward. Um, and oh, that is I was super learning, awkward. Totally, totally. <laughs> and you know, I was I was like twenty. How old was I? I was twenty three or something. Uh -huh. Wait, was that twenty three? Yeah, yeah, I was about twenty three and um, twenty three, twenty four. And uh, uh, there was just shit that wasn't getting done, right? Like I'm a fastidious copy editor, and the menus would have typos, and it really bothered me. And there wasn't, you know, there weren't any new drinks happening or anything like that. So I. Um, at a certain point after being there for a year or, you know, a year or so, and um, I was working night shifts at the point, I asked them, I sort of lobbied for the jo job of bar manager, and they gave it to me. Um, I, again, did not do a very good job. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I did a pretty terrible job, but I learned a ton about tequila and mezcal, and um, I also learned kind of to be comfortable in... Hmm, how do you how, how do I explain this? Uh, people didn't expect a 23 year old woman when they came in to to look for the bar manager to taste new tequila or mezcal. Sure. So I learned how to get comfortable with that misperception, you know, Okay. and just to like, I, cer I certainly, you know, I'm I'm more of the school where I will. I will learn way way more than i need to know just to prove my right to belong you know yeah. um and then Do you have any funny uh funny um stories about when that kind of made its reared its ugly head like at a meeting or anything um uh, at oh gosh i mean honestly like after after i left um la and moved up to the bay area and i grew up i grew up in the bay area um so uh -huh. it's coming home for me but i i went to trade school and became a cabinet maker and oh, what? I, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's my other life is actually making furniture. Um, oh, wow. So in fact, I was teaching woodworking at this, um, at this art center in Oakland called the crucible, uh, while I started small hand foods. And it was really funny oh, wow. because all the bar people thought it was really weird that I was into woodworking, but then all my woodworking students thought it was like, couldn't believe that I was really into cocktails, <laughs> but yeah. like, I am just as dorky about long grain to long grain gluing surface as I am to the, you know, the history of, of the Mai Tai. Like I, it's this, I don't know. I just, uh, yeah. That Anyways. is too funny. Uh, yeah, no, it's something we share. Cause I, I, we, uh, redid our cabinets about two, two years ago and, uh, uh -oh. I went like full bore, like nice. everything. Uh, yeah, no, it, it's crazy. Um, and it's just like bartending, you know, it, once you start to learn the variables and stack them up, it just, uh, it's, it's an amazing thing to, to, conceptualize something and then have it in front of you uh it's pretty pretty yeah. cool yeah yeah so no that's yeah, amazing yeah. no, no idea it. yeah yeah um I, and i you know and i totally learned it like real old school method which was not computer generated drawings it was like full scale front elevation and side elevation laid on top of each other on big paper mm -hmm. and um god later on i went to art school and like no one knew what to make of me but anyways regardless <laughs> when, uh, being a cabinet maker and also teaching woodworking that's another another place where it's just I am not what people expect. So I mean, sure. teach, you know, teaching woodworking at a at an art center, half my students were retired men, and first day <laughs> they'd come in, 
And I'm like, hey, welcome to woodworking. <laughs> you know, because what They're are we like, gonna do? What? Like, I do know more than they know. So, sure. uh, you know, it's it's one of those things. Like, it's that kind of fake it till you make it kind of things. Like, I'm right. I do belong here. I am very uh -huh. good at this. Um, I'm not entirely comfortable right off the bat, but the more I pretend that I'm comfortable, the more comfortable I get until finally sure. I'm just like, yeah, okay. Yep. This is it. If you got, if you're right. uncomfortable with it, then that's on you. But like, I'm very good at this. <laughs> so, you know, um, so I think that, you know, that, that, that sort of thing started with me being, you know, a 23 year old bar manager of a large tequila program. It's sure. just not what people expect. And it's kind of like, well, what am I going to do? Not, not pursue the things that interest me mm -hmm. just because you, you know, just because it, it, it doesn't fit into your like narrow window of what, of what I should be or what right. this role should be. Like, I just, I don't know. I'm too entrepreneurial. I can't not own my own business. I have to. Right. So uh, it's yeah. amazing. And this is kind of a perfect segue um, because obviously you have a lot of diverse experience. Um, and you could have kind of taken this in a lot of different directions, but what really made you take that jump from, all right, I'm, I'm kind of a badass in a bar. I know exactly what I'm doing. Um, and now I want to go from managing, tending bar to owning uh, a company. Mm, okay. Well, first of all, I wasn't really a badass at the bar. <laughs> okay. I, was small foods. I was, I mean, I was, I was good and I cared mm -hmm. more than, um, than a lot of people at the time. Um, but, uh, uh, and, and I didn't even start managing until well, until like, until I opened up the interval, which was, sure. you know, three years ago. So, mm -hmm. um, when I, when I started, I like this, it's, I didn't expect it to grow the way that it did. And I, you know, no one knew what was going to happen in the craft cocktail industry, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I really just. Well, actually, okay, let me, let's bring it back to, to bartending school. So okay. when I went to bartending school, I learned, um, I, I learned a Mai Tai and my, my teacher, Randy with an I, um, would teach us acronyms to remember certain drinks. And I okay. specifically remember the acronym for Mai Tai was RATS, P-R, R-A-T-S-P-R. And what that stands for, and it was built in a glass. So no, not just, just built, not shaken, not stirred, not nothing. Um, in order, rum, amaretto triple sec, sweet and sour, pineapple juice, rum. So that second okay. rum was your dark rum float, right? So this is okay. now actually what we think of as a, like a Hawaiian style Mai Tai, um, right. which we have on the menu right now at the interval on a page called Tiki Not Tiki. So it's like drinks that people think of as Tiki drinks, but that don't actually fit into the rubric of what the, the history of Tiki is. It's a real fun right. idea. Um, so anyways, at, at Slanador, we didn't have Amaretto. It's a pretty small, like small selection of, mm -hmm. of ingredients there. We didn't carry anything with high fructose corn syrup. So no Coca-Cola, no, you know, things like that. Um, we didn't have a lot of the, of those modifiers that seemed ubiquitous in a cheap bar. So, you know, mm -hmm. no Midori, no Amaretto, no, you know, a lot of things like that. So, um, when people would order a Mai Tai, our MO was to give them a mixture of rum and juice. You know, it, 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 had, it had pineapple juice in it. It may have had orange juice in it. Pay, the pastry mm -hmm. department would make us a raspberry syrup, so we would put some of that in it to make it pink. Um, and, I, you know, to me, I was like, it's not a Mai Tai if it doesn't have almond in it. Like, that, that right. to me is the defining flavor of a Mai Tai. Um, and... I think honestly, Eric just got Eric Adkins, who's the beverage director of the Slanador Group and my mentor. Um, he probably just got tired of listening to me, bitch. So uh, he finally, <laughs> he, you know, he, he he was really into classic cocktails, and um, so he went and did the research and came back and was like, "You're right. It needs this almond syrup called Orjat. Also, it doesn't have pineapple juice in it." Almond X. I was like, okay, so. <laughs> So um, he, he said, you know, but I've looked at all the orja on the market and it's all shit. Like there's, you know, it's sure. high fructose corn syrup and, um, you know, fractionated palm all kernel oil and like real weird yeah. shit. Um, and he's like, so if you want us to make a good Mai Tai, why don't you make some orja? And, uh, and I was like, fine, bitches. Like I, I will always step up to a challenge. Challenge for accepted. Sure, for yeah. sure. So I started making every recipe I could get my hands on and learned a lot um, along the way. So. Uh -huh. You know, the Jerry Thomas recipe, delicious, but it was so thick that you, that like, it was the texture of pomade 
And I was like, this is not going to work in a bar <laughs> setting. And then I made Darcy O'Neill's recipe, which doesn't taste at all like the flavor of amaretto. And, you know, tons of, you know, all this research later, I learned that it's because amaretto is made from apricot kernels, um, sure. uh, which botanically are identical to uh, bitter almonds. Now, bitter almonds, oh, okay. um, are it's illegal to import bitter almonds into the United States because they have two chemical compounds um, benzaldehyde and amygdalin that in the presence of water or saliva, uh, metabolize into, uh, hydrogen cyanide. So oh, okay. well, there, you know, until, until pretty recently you could buy bitter almonds here, but apparently some people, you know, used like snacked on them and, um, and died. So, um, or at least got very ill or something. So the FDA was like, nope. But the thing is you can still find apricot kernels here. So it's just, it's a little, it's a little weird. Um, yeah. so uh, looking at these historical recipes, most of them call for some, you know, some small proportion of bitter almonds to the sweet almonds. And they mm -hmm. vary from, you know, four to one to 10 to one. Or the, so um, uh, I, you know, I learned all this about droops, which is the, the family that, that it's like stone fruit, right? So mm -hmm. plum kernels and apricot kernels and, and peach pits and cherry pits and the seed inside all of them all taste like amaretto right interesting so okay. um apple seeds do too the apples are not droops but um but they they also are are high in that um in that compound um so i i started um i found some apricot kernels and started making it with that and be, people get you know some people are just like what with cyanide and it's like yeah i've done um I've consulted scientists and I've, and I've done the, the work on this end and I use a very small proportion. And, uh, uh, I think the, I think the conclusion is that you would have to drink like eight large bottles of my Orjot to have <laughs> any impact from the apricot kernels, at which sure. point I can't imagine you're not going into a diabetic coma with all that sugar. So, <laughs> um, so it's fine. It is fine. Um, but yeah, because people weren't using extract in, you know, the 1800s, mm -hmm. um, uh, that's, I decided that that's what I wanted and, um, and kind of that conceptual development piece. It's like the, I am looking at these pre-prohibition era cocktail ingredients and trying to be true to that, but also, you know, yeah, I guess just not, not just old fashioned for old fashioned's sake. Sure. We're really trying to make the best drinks possible. So, you know, when I, I, I kept on fucking with the, the Orjot recipe and I made this, you know, I made one version. I kind of combined a few different techniques to get something that was delicious and pourable, like totally functional in a bar environment. And the Orjot was beautiful and it was nuanced and had this like light orange flower water quality and it was perfect. And then I made a Mai Tai and all the, all the like subtlety was lost. And Completely I was like, gone. Okay, great. Like, it, it, what I, it, it, the point is not to make the best orjot possible. The point is to make the best mai tai. Like we don't drink orjot, we drink mai tai. Right. We drink cocktails. So the whole point of all of my serves is like I'm not, I'm I'm trying to make the best mai tai possible. I'm trying to make the best pisco punch possible. Like it's not so you know it's not just about making the best syrup. The best the best syrup is just not what you think it is. Let's just put it that way. Yeah, yeah. and I think this is one of the biggest points um, that I've kind of really focused on with, with um, this interview process is there's a significant di uh, difference between products that are out in the market that have been made for the mass for masses mm -hmm. versus products that have been developed by bartenders for cocktail programs. Mm -hmm. The end result in a drink is substantially different. Yeah. Well, like I said, I mean, before I started Small Hand Foods, the, the, the products that were on the market weren't even made from actual fruit. Right. So, you know, for example, pineapple is notoriously volatile. If mm -hmm. you buy a pineapple syrup that isn't made from actual pineapples, even if it's all natural flavorings, it almost never has actual pineapple in it. Like the mm -hmm. flavorings aren't derived from pineapple. Um, it's really, it's, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. And, it, and it's not so, it's not so modern. I mean, I, mm -hmm. have, an, I have an old soda fountain book from 1900 that talks about excuse me, that talks about certain, um, com certain compounds that you would use to make some of these <laughs> syrups. 
Sure. You know, so it's like it's not just it's not just super modern, but you know, but something like Orjat, I really feel is a you know was a uh, a victim of the industrialization of food in general, really. Sure. I mean, it. Uh, so when you when you have an actual orgeat made from actual almonds, you you have protein and fat from the nuts in the mm -hmm. syrup, and because of that fat, when you mix it into things, it looks milky. The same reason that um, uh, that absinthe luches right? Mm -hmm. Because of the essential oils that are in there. So that provides this like sort of cloudy, cloudy effect, right? Sure. Um, when you have uh, <laughs> the, the worst example that I saw was the Trader Vicks Orjot. Okay. Um, and Trader Vicks is where the Mai Tai was invented, you know? Right. So like, I'm pretty sure that in 1944, they weren't, they weren't using Orjot like this. Um, but when you take away the almonds and just use almond flavoring, you don't get that cloudy effect because you're mm -hmm. taking away the fat content. So sure. to, if people are used to having a cloudy effect, you have to add that, you have to add fat back in. And so the Trader Vicks one adds uh, fractionated palm kernel oil um, uh, okay. so that it has that fat in it so that it will create a cloudiness when you mix it. But it's just like, wait a second, <laughs> you know, you have taken this pro this this thing that used to be made from nuts and now like kind of made a made a mock up of it, right? Using not yeah. nuts, you know, and it, I mean it's it's still a big a huge thing for for modern society is this this kind of uh, divorce from actual food. Um, it's why you know you go into a grocery store and you can go to the bakery section and buy a loaf of bread where the the ingredients are flour, water, salt and, you know, na like natural yeast. Then you can go to the bread aisle and get a loaf of bread that also says that it's bread but has 40 ingredients in it. Sure. Yeah. You know, like we are we have both and a lot of people aren't paying attention I don't I think people aren't paying enough attention to to uh, those differences and the fact that there's no, you know, it, yeah, I don't know. Anyways. <laughs> no, absolutely. And uh, I think, um, you know, one of the things that we do as bartenders and cocktail creators is try to find the best possible way to use the ingredients that we have. Like, what is the best expression that I could possibly make for this, for the final drink? Um, and, uh, you know, using products like this and developing your own syrups and tinctures and bitters and all that stuff um, could be a really great exercise in trying to figure all that out. And, paying attention to the ingredients that actually go into the final drink. Yeah, um, I see that all the time. I mean, when, you know, uh, when I first started, uh, started Small Hand Foods and really the Orjot and the gum syrup and the pineapple gum syrup were the three that I started with. Mm -hmm. And I remember going into this program that, that used to carry my products and had stopped. And they had someone in there who was like, I make all the syrups myself. And I'm like, oh, awesome. Can I taste your pineapple gum? And she gave it to me. And I was like, ah, oh, you use a masticating juicer, don't you? And she was like, oh, I love, I, oh yeah, I love my champion. And I was like, uh-huh, okay, cool. I, you know, the, the, I'm very specific about my process because the way that I juice my pineapples, I remove all of the fiber, but I keep sure. the, the juice, which is why the product has a clarity to it. And when you use pineapple made from, from a masticating juicer, you're getting a lot of that fiber in there. You know, that's like still it's being ground up, but you end up with a sure. with a very cloudy product and then you uh -huh. end up with a muddy or chalky texture. Same thing when people make orjat using commercial almond milk, like my process removes the fiber because I don't want that in the drink, um, but but keeps the protein and the fat. If you use commercial almond milk, commercial almond milk is made by finely grinding almonds so, so fine into a very, very smooth paste and mixing them that with water. So what you're getting is all of the nut in there. So not just the protein and fat, but you're getting the fiber as well. You make orgeat with that. Yes, it's a lot faster than than the way I do it, pressing them. Um, right. But you end up with an orgeat with a chalky texture, which is yeah. not what I want. It's still you know still the same ingredients, but it's just this handling of it. Again, because yeah. the goal is to make the the most perfect you know mai tai or Japanese cocktail or pisco punch or whatever it is. No, that's awesome. That's really cool. Did, did the 
Did you actually ask the lady uh, about her champion and did she have a response to it or? I asked if she had a champion. She said, yes, I love it. And I was like, okay, cool. If you don't know, if you can't tell the difference right. between that, it, I'm, you know, having some, essentially, if you don't know me, you see me as like an annoying brand rep where I'm just like, well, this product is better than what you're making with your hands. Yeah, and, that's true. You can't really win anything on that end. Yeah, exactly. And really, yeah. I mean, with this craft cocktail revival, so many programs now feel like house made is, is really what they should be doing. And not enough yeah. people have the critical analysis to, um, uh, or like the 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 they they haven't developed their palate enough to mm -hmm. to be able to taste the difference. Yeah, and um, actually, since we're kind of on the subject, um, one of the things that um, has always frustrated me and um, was this kind of balance of I'm going to do everything myself, no matter how long it takes me. Right. So that way. At the end of the day, I'm spending more time developing product than I am in front of the customers. Yep. And like the the cost, when you start to calculate those costs out, mm -hmm. a homemade like a house made syrup is not always the best idea. Oh God! Uh, for no, so no, many no. reasons. So many reasons. Um, <laughs> I mean, and it's, and it's, yeah, I base my my typical customer arc goes. Uh, oh, you started a bar program and you buy my stuff. And then you, and then like the ownership or the management or whatever, just you know, decides that like, oh, they can make it themselves. And then they do sure. it for a little while, and then, <laughs> um, and then they start to look at their labor costs, and then they call, and then they like start to order my products again, <laughs> or or you get um, uh, a restaurant group that's expanding, and they're trying sure. to centralize their like like put together a commissary or something like that, but ultimately they end up um, realizing that the labor costs is so, is so drastic. Um, yeah. Or they, have, they expect the bar manager to do it all and because the bar manager is salaried, so they are not paying extra hourly. And then what you end up with is a program where the bar manager is not tending bar very often. Yeah. You know? Oh, so. and plus the hours on that. I mean, that's, a, that's exactly what I went through as well, just um... – you know, you have your normal duties, which are about a 50 hour a week job. Plus you have production on top of that. Um, right. It's a, you're, you're signing up for a lot. There's no doubt about it. And there's a lot, yeah. there's enough passionate people in the industry that, you know, that could, uh, that could definitely work, but man, you're signing up for uh, a lot of work. Yeah. And also you like, I mean, it seems to me that not that there's a lot of bar managers that aren't really um, paying attention, at least to the level of detail that they should, of the mm -hmm. economics of of running the bar. You know, sure. that like yeah. hitting an eighteen percent pour cost uh, based on what you pay for your ingredients is one thing, but at the end of the day, once you're looking at all of your numbers, your comps, your all of your labor costs, like all of that stuff, you get to see where your actual profit is and. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of a lot of bar managers that I've seen, they are responsible for the former, but not given enough information to adjust the latter. You know? Yeah, and I think this is um, one of the uh, one of the biggest things in our industry is that we don't educate our managers enough. Um, no, no, there I is mean, very little education as far as the evolution of a um, a bar manager. In my opinion, I've never been exposed to it except for through mentorship, um, finding the right people to work for. Right, um, right. But it's really hard to get the information unless you're really purposeful and um, deliberate about getting it. Yeah, I mean, I also think it's just that because the craft cocktail world has exploded, has gone, mm -hmm. has gotten so big so fast that what you end up with is, you know, a, say a restaurant that 20 years ago could have opened up and thrown a Cosmo and a margarita and a daiquiri on their menu and and called it a day. And right. just hired people who, you know, they'd have a Mr. Boston behind the bar and they'd figure it out and everyone mm -hmm. free poured and fine. Um, now, I, and it's so funny, I actually had a, a meeting yesterday with someone I'm going to do a little bit, um, like a new program um, that I'm going to help out just like a day, a day of training with the staff. And she mm -hmm. is the owner. And what you know she's saying she wants them to come like the bar staff to come up with some interesting drinks and through our conversation i realized i was like what you're gonna have what you're gonna be fighting against 
is the bartenders knowing more about cocktails than you do and not mm-hmm. respecting like the whatever it is that you want to that you want to put forth. And sure. the way to do that, you can do it by knowing more than the staff, which is obviously how I how I handle my my bars. But just because I'm like a stupid like a you know obsessive ca- classic cocktail book reader, and you know uh-huh. I, I read everything. But but the way you do it is actually becoming more comfortable and saying like, hey, I don't know this thing. Let's work this out. Like sure. Learning how to find balance in a cocktail and saying, hey, I like the idea of these ingredients together. Can we put these together and try and make a good drink and so right. you're kind of collectively putting you know uh building a a a good um kind of vocabulary for you and the staff you know so anyways i think i just i don't i don't see that enough and so mm-hmm. what i what i've seen a whole lot is ownership that knows that they need to have a good bar but doesn't but don't know how how to execute it so they sure. go this is they look around for a bar manager. But they're not really sure what all they need from this bar manager. They just know that they need a good cocktail bar. So mm-hmm. they expect the bar manager to, you know, deal with every single problem on site and do, you know, like trainings and also tend bar and also control costs and all this stuff. And you end up with these with these poor bar managers that are so overworked. And a lot of times they end up making less money. And I keep telling people to advocate for themselves. I'm like, if you have to drop down from bartending four nights a week to bartending three nights a week, make sure that, that whatever you're getting hourly or salary wise is making up for that one night less a week of tips. Right. You know? Yeah. And I think it's kind of something that's backwards about our industry is if the natural progression in any other industry is the, the more you escalate through any program, sales or marketing or um, management, there's a reciprocal increase in your pay. Right. But in the bar world, you take a significant decrease in your salary in the Bay Area here anyways, to have that title of bar manager, um, right. especially if you're a full-time bar manager. Um, people don't advocate for themselves, number one. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and I'm not, like, I think it just has to do with people's lack of experience. And because mm-hmm. there's like, there's actually a, not that many people who who can um, who can do all those things I said, the, like, sure. you know, the, the, the cost analysis and, um, and all of the training and all like everything that, that really like a stellar bar manager should be able to do, um, mm-hmm. really. And well, part of it, to be quite honest, I think that it's all too much for one person. I feel like that these, these things should be that bar managers should have more support from the mm-hmm. infrastructure than they typically do. Um, oh, I, I very I'm with you. I'm, I'm, I'm sure a lot of heads are nodding right now. <laughs> as, as I hear this, like, Damn right. <laughs> yeah. Um, for, yeah. I, cause, but I, I don't think it's intentional. I think it's just that ownership doesn't actually understand every piece of what it takes to do this job, sure. you know? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. I, I, anyways, an owner is like, I'm opening up a restaurant. I know I need a good cocktail program. So they start asking around and they end up hiring someone who really doesn't know all of the pieces to it. And so mm-hmm. that person is so eager to advance their career that they are not actually, uh, um, that, 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 they're, that they're willing to take a pay cut, you know, yeah. or they don't even do the math to realize how much less they're going to be making. Mm-hmm. Or they figure this is something that I am willing to take because of the next career steps that are going to happen or because of what I'm going to learn. And right. there's a lot of people who don't have the skill set who are willing to take less money. Yeah. And so then yeah. you end up with people who are trying to start consultancies who are being underbid by people who are not as qualified. And the ownership right. doesn't know. The ownership doesn't know what it takes. They just know that they need a good bar. So right. they're, of course, I mean, restaurants are notoriously slim profit margins. So, if, well, of course, why wouldn't you? take the, the, you know, like the lower price person. Sure. You know, yeah. and you've got, and you've got a big pool of people who are willing to do it for less. Yeah, and absolutely. You end up with people who are quite, who are actually good at it and understand all the pieces who, you know, are struggling to get the jobs. It's kind of, yeah, yeah I don't know. I, I think that there's a, a, a number of things that, that need to happen that need to change. And when I, as I'm putting together, you know, the, 
my own project, I'm looking at all of this stuff, like how I yeah. can, how I can change the, the employment model to better serve my staff to, to, you know, make, make the restaurant or make the bar more profitable. Um, but also be able to funnel that back into, um, back into the staff so that sure. we can, I can have a more dedicated staff who's, you know, so then you end up with these bar managers who open up a program are working 80 hour weeks. The ownership is annoyed that they're not doing everything <laughs> that, they, that they expected them to do. And then the bar manager quits and it's like, right. okay. And, but and there's, there's someone else vacuum. in line. Right. Yeah. Exactly. No, it's, it's, yeah. it's true. I'm like getting goosebumps like during this entire conversation, <laughs> like flat PTSD flashbacks going on right now. <laughs> They're like, oh, I remember that. Absolutely. Yeah, um, for sure. No, and uh, you know, it's, it's one of the things that I, um, we always get emails from and just like, look, I'm in this world. I've done this job for a very long time. I don't know what to do next. Mm. And I think that's one of the reasons um, I'm so interested in kind of showing a different model and kind of you know, saying there's there's a better way to do it. Um, if you're entrepreneurial minded, here are a couple of different examples of people that have gone out on their own and mm -hmm. done these things. Um, and hopefully mm -hmm. kind of create a different mindset of, you know, the skills I'm developing now are definitely going to work for me later on um, as a business owner. Um, so that was a segue into <laughs> a question I have for you is um, obviously you have a lot of experience with flavor extraction and refining flavors and, and delivery and all that. Mm -hmm. um, but what other skills have you developed as a bartender that have been really instrumental for you as a business owner? Um, well, you know, a lot of it is really just, uh, well, not a lot of it, uh, but a significant part of it is quite simply the ability to be charming on demand. Ah, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I found that to be fantastically useful. And now as I'm, you know, putting uh, like, I've got, um, you know, I'm bringing on investors for this bar, the bar that I'm going to, that I'm building. Um, that has served me very well because that's what investors want to see. Sure. Um, and the, I like, I am naturally outgoing, but I also, I also can get socially overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. Um, to the extent that if, especially if there's a lot of attention on me, I can get, start to get really uncomfortable. Um, sure. I remember, uh, years ago it was San Francisco cocktail week, which obviously we haven't had in years. So, um, I think this was 2011. Uh, I got a, an award for a trail, like the trailblazer award or whatever it was. And mm -hmm. at the after party, um, you know, there's all these bar stations set around and I knew all the bartenders and I'm sitting there carrying this fucking award in a dress and I'm just like, and people keep talking to me and I got, and I, I was just like, this is like, I was so uncomfortable that I finally went to one of my friends at one of these bartending stations and said, Hey, can I come back and make drinks with you for a bit? And I kicked off my shoes under the table and, and just started making drinks because I'm like, I'm, I'm much better. Right. Like, like You're I'm more like, comfortable I, in that I'm environment. More, yeah. 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 Where I have this bar between me and you, where the focus is now on me giving you a, a an experience that you're going to enjoy. So right. if I can do that, then um yeah. So so I think bartending has taught me that where sometimes like like at Slanador where there's four bartenders every night and um uh uh, you could, well, at least at night we had our, we had set stations, but, mm -hmm. um, at lunch we didn't. And, you know, sometimes you, you would say, okay, do you want to work the service well, where you're not really talking to people? Or do you want to work personality where you are talking to people? And right. some people have the mindset of like, I don't really feel like talking to anyone. I'm just going to do the service well. Yeah. And then another kind of person, um, would say, I don't really feel like talking to people. So let me be personality because it'll like get you out of it, get you right. out of that, that mindset. And I find them both useful at different times, you know? Um, but certainly there are times in which when I am feeling uncomfortable or not particularly social, that being a bartender, that, that giving that service is makes like turns my night around, makes me happier, sure. you know? Yeah. No, absolutely. I remember, um, so just a side story, I was a craps dealer in Las Vegas, um, which got me into bartending later on. But 
um, in the craps table, the attention is always on the dice or the person that's shooting. And I wanted to develop myself in, a, in gaming. So I took the job as a um, uh, blackjack dealer. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I practiced shuffling and all that stuff and uh, finally got on my first live game. And uh, I go into the game and all of a sudden, you know, with craps, everyone's looking around and not paying attention to you. And uh, at the crap or the 21 table, the blackjack table, everybody is staring at you. <laughs> it is probably one of the most like nail on a chalkboard, you know, moments of just like, holy cow, I have to entertain these people. Like I'm the right. only source of entertainment. Yeah. Uh, it was uh, it was completely unnerving. And uh, so I remember the first shuffle I did, we had six six decks of cards and it's probably 12 inches tall. <laughs> sure. I sprayed the entire deck all over the place, which oh, means like no. cards everywhere. <laughs> and I was like, oh, this sucks. This is not a good start. Um, <laughs> but that absolutely translated into my bartending, um, you know, being able to deal with people one on one and, you know, going out and being able to have those instantly charming, <laughs> like you like you mentioned. But yeah, that was that was my first shift behind the 21. And I after that, I hated it. <laughs> <laughs> <Completely> hated it. <laughs> yeah, I believe, I believe it. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. I don't know. I've, I've, as a business owner, I found that to be very useful. So to the point where my business partner, and now I didn't start with a business partner. I brought one on um, about five years ago, um, uh -huh. and it wasn't even. We weren't even intending on him being my business partner, but we we worked together so well that mm -hmm. that's that's what he became. Um, but we had like the first bank loan we got. Um, we had to do a presentation for, you know, we got it through this, uh, this nonprofit in San Francisco called TMC working solutions. Mm -hmm. And they provide, um, you know, like, like business loans to small, uh, you know, up and coming companies. Um, and we had to do it's, I mean, it's so, it's so ridiculous. Cause at this point we've gone through so many loans and lines of credit and paid them all back. And really with a, a small business like this, it's really that cash flow that will destroy you, you know, where, sure. uh, where I have to pay, pay up front for all the ingredients and all the production, and then we ship it out. And then, you know, the distributors pay us net 30. So it's like, I need to float, you know, a hundred thousand dollars every month. Sure. So yeah. having, having lines of credit and having loans where like the business is totally profitable. It's just, we just don't get to keep very much of that money, you know, because <laughs> the, 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 right. we just keep on growing. Um, but anyways, doing a presentation for this board, um, at, at TMC working solutions, it's like, I brought in, I made cocktails for everyone because I'm good at it and I'm charming. And the idea right. is I need to make you want to give me money. So that, that I, I do think that that personality thing is really, really useful, but it's also, I will say that I don't think that it is necessarily exactly as I have seen younger bartenders do it. Mm -hmm. Where there's where there's more swagger, or they will talk about things that they don't necessarily know. I think okay. it's far better service to say if someone asks you something you don't know to say like, "Oh, I don't know." Um, if you know the recipe for that, and I have the ingredients, I'm more than happy to make it for you. Or if you, you know, if you can wait a few minutes while I run upstairs and look that up, I will totally yeah. do that. Um, if what you need to do is get a drink in your hand right now, let me make you something else, and then in in you know in five ten minutes when I've got a little bit of a break. I'll look up the recipe and we'll see if we can't have that for you for your, for your second drink, you know, right. but I see a lot of people kind of bullshitting and that yeah. is, that's bad customer service, you know? Right. And I think there's this weird like stigma of like almost shame of not knowing something and considering how diverse and huge our history is as a, as a industry. Um, there's very few people that can know everything about our business. Right. Yeah. I mean, um, the, the the further I get in this industry, the more comfortable I am saying when I don't know something. Sure. And, you know, and, and part of it is also that, like, honestly, if I haven't heard of a drink, there's no reason why I should have because, mm -hmm. because of, of how much I read. Um, sure. <laughs> but, uh, but also just having this sense that it is right that I am here. And that's, yeah. I think, what, what a lot of younger bartenders and bar managers don't get, that it's like, it's okay that I am, that I am in this position with the amount that I know right now. And mm -hmm. it's a constant growth. It's, it's like a never ending growth. Sure. I yeah. mean, I'll never, I'll never be done learning. 
Yeah, and I think that's a, um, a mentality that um, hopefully, you know, the professionals in this industry all, all kind of have in common is just this hunger to learn as much as you possibly can. Yeah. And knowing you're never going to get to the end, but yeah. just that kind of constant drive of like, there's more stuff to learn and there's more ways to be to improve, um, I think is absolutely essential for a long um, exposure in this career. Yeah, I remember uh, chatting with kind of one of the, mm, let's just say old guard bartenders in San Francisco or bar, mm -hmm. bar personalities um, several years ago. And uh -huh. Uh, so this is, you know, these are, these are people who are maybe, maybe a half step up from me in terms of my generation, like people who are on the same level as Eric Atkins, you know, or something sure. like that. Um, so it was not Eric and I'm not going to say who it was, but <laughs> <laughs> we had this conversation where I, you know, I think it was, um, we were talking about creme de menthe and we were talking about distillation and blah, 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 blah. Um, and I kept on like kind of d going deeper and going deeper. And at a certain point, this guy says to me, he's like, Hey, you know what, Jen, at the end of the day, it's just a job. And I was like, we are done. <laughs> I now have, I now don't have anything in common with you. Like, I've met, yeah. you know, I'm like, I'm like, it's cool what you do, but I, now I know where your limit is. And right. that is, I am not, that's not where I'm at. I, will, right. you know, uh, it's amazing. <laughs> it's just a job. Oh, ah, God. I mean, oh, man. Is, sure, sure, it is just a job, but like, God damn, we are so privileged. Like, the fact that I get to go to, you know, go to work when I was bartending regularly and go and like make people happy. Yeah. And be able to joke and kid around with the people that I work with. And I don't yep. have to sit at a desk and it'll make cold calls or like any of this. I just don't understand when people, when people complain, I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? Dude, our job is so great. It's like, pretty go amazing. Be, go be a secretary for a while and then come and tell, you know, for. Yeah, we're construction. That sucks. Yeah, for, for, 50, <laughs> for $16 an hour and then, and then come here and complain about, about, oh, so-and-so didn't put away, you know, they, they put the bar tools on the left side of the well when they cleaned instead of the right side. Oh dear <laughs> Lord. Like, Oh my God. Perspective people. <laughs> <laughs> like you, I mean, if that is what is annoying you, like you need some fucking perspective. <laughs> right. Seriously. <laughs> oh man. So, um, uh, let's see. So what's, were there any kind of surprises for you along the way of opening small hand foods or any <laughs> challenges that you faced? Well, um, I didn't intend on, on owning a company of the size, <laughs> <laughs> the whole thing was a surprise to me. Seriously? I, so yeah. Oh yeah. No, when I started, I, I was making, I was making Orjot for the slanted door. I would right. make it at my house a couple liters at a time. And Eric would pay me in whiskey. Then sounds pretty damn good to me. <laughs> it was great. Um, <laughs> keep bear in mind that back then happy 12 year was our well whiskey. What? Um, <laughs> I know. <laughs> Yep. Happy 12 year. Oh um, my God. No, no, I know. It was ridiculous. Like I can't, I would just buy it to, you know, have in my house to drink. I'm like, why the fuck didn't I buy cases and cases? Barrels um, of that stuff, man. I oh my know. God. I know. <laughs> I would be a millionaire. Uh, <laughs> um, and then, uh, so that, I mean, that's what I was doing. And then Thad Vogler, um, came back from Guatemala. So Thad is, Thad actually was the person who hired me at the Slanted Door. Um, mm -hmm. and he let, so this was summer of 2005 and he left at the end of the year to go to, to Guatemala for a year. And that's when Eric took over the bar program. And so a year after that, Thad came back. I had been playing around with this Orjot stuff. Um, gosh, was it then? No, cause I started smelling foods in 08. So anyways, took a little while, but, um, ultimately Thad was opening up the bar program at Beretta mm -hmm. and he had really liked the, the Orjot that I was making for the Slanted Door, and he asked me if I had ever worked with gum Arabic because he wanted a, a gum syrup and a pineapple gum syrup. Um, he wanted to put on a Pisco Punch, which you know was created in San Francisco in 1893 at the Royal Bank Exchange, which is where the Transamerica Pyramid stands now, mm -hmm. um, by Duncan Nickel. So he was, Thad's a big um, 
Bill Boothby fan. So cocktail Bill Boothby has got a bunch of books out there and, you know, a bon vivant of, uh, around the turn of the century. Um, so he wanted, he wanted those. So I started playing around with those and figuring out how to work with gum Arabic and ended up coming up with, you know, a couple recipes that worked really well. And then Thad said to me, um, okay, so if I put these drinks on this menu at what is going to be a very busy bar, uh, can you make enough? And yeah. I, and I, I kind of looked at him and I was like, sure. <laughs> and <laughs> so at that point I, I went and I got my permits and started working out of a commercial kitchen. Um, and yeah, I, for the first two years, I cooked more or less to order. So I had, at that point I had Slanador, I had Beretta uh -huh. and then let me see Brooke Arthur, when she was the bar manager at range, she mm -hmm. really, she wanted my syrup. So she started ordering stuff. Um, I had one Craig Lane was the bar manager at Farallon. He started ordering my stuff. So, you know, I mean, really when I started, I thought, oh, this, this, there will be six bars in San Francisco interested in what I'm doing. And I was just going to do it because I just, what the fuck else was I doing with my life? Sure. Like I had graduated from art school and I had, um, I had, while I had sold some, fur some furniture, cause I, I got my degree in furniture. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I didn't particularly like the artist's lifestyle. I found it really alienating and lonely and I didn't like it, but, and it was starting to ruin art for me, like trying to figure out how to make a piece that someone is going to want to buy was kind of fucking up art for me. So I realized I was like, I don't want to try to sell art anymore. I want to keep it as something that I love. Sure. So, you know, I wasn't doing anything else and I definitely have this entrepreneurial mindset. Um, but like, you know, I, I just, it, it was unexpected, you know, yeah. I just didn't, didn't see, I didn't see it. Um, I didn't see what was going to happen to the bar industry. I don't think, I don't know if anyone did really. Um, so yeah, anyway, for two years, I cooked more or less to order. Um, so I would take orders by, uh, thir on Thursdays. So I mm -hmm. knew how many, or by Fridays, right, rather. Um, so I knew uh, how many of, of what ingredients to buy. And mm -hmm. then the, uh, I would soak the almonds for, for a few days. And then I would go into the kitchen and cook and, um, fill the bottles and, um, and seal them and cap them and put the capsules on and label them. And I delivered everything on Thursdays and then I would take everyone's orders again. So I did that for two years every oh, wow. week. I didn't pay myself anything. Um, and really kind of all of the, the, most of the major expansions of, of my business were preceded by about a week of crying <laughs> where, where <laughs> I'm just like, I'm just so fucking stressed out. Right. And so at this point, um, heaven's dog has opened up. So this is about uh -huh. 2010. Um, I was tending bar there once a week and at slanted door three nights a week. And um, doing small hand foods. And I just kept on getting more and more business. And I was just so stressed out. And I, I got to the, I got to the point where like, I, I really needed to, um, to, 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 to expand. Mm -hmm. And I needed to, to also like do that before I started paying myself. So I'm sure. very, I'm very fortunate. My mom loaned me a little bit of money. Um, and I was able to kind of use that to supplement my income. And I went down to bartending part-time. And, um, and so I, I was able to, after about six months, when, when um, I had built up the business enough to where I was able to start paying myself. But it was, you know, when it, when it first started, it was 500 bucks a month. And then it was $1,000 a month. And, yeah. I really, you know, I don't make a living doing it, but I, but I love it. I love it. And as yeah. we, as you know, I'm a big proponent of, um, of quality of life, of lifestyle. So for mm -hmm. me, I would rather own this business and, um, that, that I feel like has integrity, um, and make less money. And, you know, there was also this, this thing in my head where I was always like, you know what? I can always pick up shit. Yeah. I, yeah. I, if, if all of this goes to shit, if I do a terrible job, I can always pick up shifts. I'm a yeah. great bartender. Right. Um, so having that, that sort of, that like holding on to this thing where I was like, I'm going to be okay. Right. Um, 
you know, and part of it is just being a bartender and, and having the ability to work with my syrups in a bar setting and making mm-hmm. sure that everything functioned well is great. And it's different from a marketing company coming up with a syrup line, you know. Sure. When you did, we were talking before um, about just how much detail and how much care you kind of put into essentially every aspect of what you do um, professionally, but in particular about the design of the bottle. Um, oh, yeah. Is that something well, you can talk about a little bit? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, it really comes down to conceptual, conceptual development, which is mm-hmm. what I learned in art school. Um, what, honestly, the best thing I ever learned in art school was this idea of if, like, what do you want your viewer to think or feel when they interact with your art? Yeah. So you have to have that in mind when you create something, then you go and create it. And if your viewer is not thinking or feeling those, th- what you want them to when they interact with your work, you are failing at your job as an artist. Sure. Which I found really, really valuable, and I use that in all of my conceptual development. So, um, so for me, I was making products for bartenders, for bartenders to be in working bars. So having a bottle that was tall and narrow that fit well into a, a speed rail was really important. Having the, um, the neck, um, like where the neck and the shoulders meet, be a really comfortable grip, holding it in the way that a bartender holds a bottle, the way we pick mm-hmm. up a bottle and put it back down. That has to be comfortable. Um, having the right size neck for a pour spout, super important. Uh, right. all, that, all that kind of stuff. So yeah. Um, yeah, to me, that's all conceptual, that's all conceptual development. It's, it's, uh, my audience is the bartender, is the bar manager. Let me figure out how to make these um, syrups in a way that makes their job easier, that is a delight to use. And, you know, I try to make my syrups as concentrated as possible. So, you know, if you look at, if you look at the price of, a, of one bottle and you're like, oh, well, there's this other company that sells it for cheaper, but then in, but theirs is more dilute and you have to use an ounce of something to get the same flavor that you would get from a half ounce of mine. Well, right. they're, you know, they're not, they're not like my product isn't twice as, as expensive. So you have to look at the like per cocktail cost, not necessarily yeah. just the like per bottle or per ounce cost. Well, and um, how much it's going to throw off the balance of the cocktail and the final volume and everything else. I mean, that's, there's a lot of consideration that goes in there. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. That's really cool. Thank you. Um, yeah, absolutely. And this is something we talked about with just, um, there's a lot of uh, spirit companies out there that should call you and uh, <laughs> hire you as a consultant to develop bottles because um, there have been so many places or so many products that have, have been marketed to me as a buyer as a well product or, you know, a premium oil or something. And ergonomically, it's an absolute nightmare. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. being able to use it in any kind of a speed scenario or volume scenario, you're just like, they kind of made, created their own worst enemy with the modeling and the packaging of, of things. Yeah. Yeah. If you have some giant, fancy, you know, milled pewter cork thing that, <laughs> that when you pull it out, it's this giant opening. Like, right. I can't put a pour spot in that. Right. So yeah. if you how, want me how to... How am I going to use this in a bar? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, definitely reach out to Jennifer for a call, you know, <laughs> product design. No, and yeah. consult- All you have to do is think of, like, how do you want this to be used? How right. do you, So do you want it to be, you know, I, there's, there's a lot of companies that are like, well, we don't want it in the well. We want it on your back bar. And, like, right. I'm sorry, but after running bars... My, I mean, after like with, like, for example, at the interval, I've had people get really excited when we bring on a product and then we don't move it because like such a high proportion of what we sell are the cocktails on the menu. If you're Uh not priced for mixing and you're not good enough to, for us to want to, you know, use you for these cocktails, like we're not going to move your product. Right. And that's just the, and then, then that is, that's one pro, that's one program. Not every program is like that. Sure. But, yeah. you know, you, you got to pay attention to like, I would rather have the sales personally uh-huh. than to have the prestige of something sitting on a back bar. Right. You know, that has to be hand sold uh, to yeah. every customer you sell it to unless you have a pretty significant <laughs> totally. following behind the brand. Totally. Or, you know, I mean, people do a really good job with marketing. You know, yeah. Hendrix has amazing marketing. People call people that's call sweet. that brand all the time. And yeah. that's not that's not really priced for mixing. That's definitely on the high end of of the per ounce cost, you know? No, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so one of the focuses we always ask um, 
people that we interview and uh, with all the products that we try to develop is listening to this podcast, what advice would you give to any bartender? Something that they could take to their next shift or even if they're mid shift or hopefully not mid shift, but opening up and listening to this podcast, um, how could they make those steps to be an entrepreneur or flavor attraction? Um, obviously mm. you're an expert in many different areas, but what advice would you give a, a, a bartender? Well, I'm going to, I'm going to actually qualify this answer first, which is just mm-hmm. something that I have, that I think is because I'm in the Bay area and sure. we have such a focus on startups, the startup culture. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people feel like they need to start their own company and it's not for everyone. And that doesn't mean that you are not as like that you're not achieving your potential. Sure. Like not, you know, there, I, I've, I've seen a lot of people who are focusing on the wrong things when trying to create a business, um, because they don't really understand it. I saw someone mm-hmm. posts on Facebook, something like, like, Hey, anyone have, you know, a, a developer, blah, blah, blah. I have a great idea. And I was just like, fuck you. Like, <laughs> like we all have great ideas. That's not business. A business is executing your great ideas. Right. Like bringing it to market. <laughs> like there's so, you know, when they say, you know, 99% perspiration, 1% inspiration, that's totally true. Right. Like, like you want to get paid for your idea? Like, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> what you, yeah. Like, you know, what you should do is if you are not the person to execute it, find people who are, but don't expect mm-hmm. to be paid a royalty on the fact that you had a, like, based on your thought. That's not business. Right. You know? Yeah. So I just, you know, I just want to caution people that like, I see, I see a lot of people here in the Bay area who want to start their own companies, but probably aren't right for starting their own companies. And that is okay. Or if you really want to own your own company, um, but you like, but like, but, but you're not really that like super diehard entrepreneur mentality, surround mm-hmm. yourself with people who are. So that you can sure. start a company with other people. Um, so, I mean, there's when you start it, there's a couple, there's a couple of things like, again, in the startup culture, people think that okay, I need to quit my job, I need to raise three million dollars, and I need to just go gung ho because like this is my life, and I'm just going to go do it. Whereas the people I know who are still in it, you know, who haven't collapsed and who haven't pivoted and all those other things, mm-hmm. um, are people who sorted out their income in some other way. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I tended bar full time for the first two years of small hand foods and then part time for, so was that 2008? So I was 10. Um, and then part time for like another five years. Sure. You know, um, or four years really until, until I ended up, uh, getting the beverage director gig at the interval. Mm -hmm. Um, and now I just tend bar like when, you know, one of my staff is sick or, or out of town or something like that. Um, I, I think it's, it, it is definitely not what people think of in the startup culture, but also s- startups notoriously fail. Right. So like, wh- I mean, I think the idea is like, what do you want to get out of this? And having, having an idea of what you want your life to look like and also putting things in place that are scalable is really important, you know? Yeah. And uh, kind of get back to our, our previous conversation about bar managers and, and all that. Um, mm-hmm. I feel like people take are, are almost um, wearing it as a badge of honor, something we talked about before, how many right. hours they work. And yeah. it's not productive hours uh, necessarily. Or it's more it, like. It, or, or it is, but, or, but yeah. it's not sustainable. Like, right. Mm-hmm. Like when I open up a place, I work hundred hour weeks. I just right. do. But but every decision I'm making is like, okay, cool. Let me let me figure out what the uh, cash reconciliation system is going to be on a daily basis, and mm-hmm. I will do that. But ultimately, I'm doing it so that I can set up a system whereby I can hire someone else to do it. Right. Because it's not sustainable that I'm the person driving to the bank every week. You right. know, like I need to figure out where my time is best served. So I think paying attention to the scalability and to the, um, the sustainability of all of this, make sure that 
you know, all of your decisions are, um, are scalable. So for example, like I've been working on, um, or rather I have, a, a um, I have a lime cordial and a grapefruit cordial that I'm going to be releasing mm -hmm. through small hand foods. Um, right now I've been making these test batches by planing the citrus with a microplane, like by, um, you know, zesting the citrus with microplane. That's mm -hmm. absolutely not sustainable. That is not scalable. It takes right. way too long to hand zest one case of limes. So I'm not going to start selling it with, you know, with stuff that I've made by hand. Now I'll make it and I'll carry it around and I'll give it to people to try, but it's not, it's, it is not suitable for business yet. Sure. So we are buying a really super cool um, Turkish zesting machine, which I'm very excited about. Um, but I'm going to have to look it up. I, <laughs> I have no idea what that looks like, and I'm super excited to find out. It's, uh, it's pretty cool. There's a couple different types of zesting machines, and I found, I found one that's going to work really well for us. Nice. Um, but so that kind of thing, like to sit there and say, and to feel like because I am suffering by zesting limes, you know, 40 hours a week on top of all of my other duties, and to mm -hmm. think that that's somehow a badge of honor, that like I care so much that I am going to suffer through this, you know, carpal tunnel and how much I hate doing this thing. Like that's, right. not, that's not, that's not a, suit, a good business decision. It's just not. Right. No, absolutely. You know? Um, and it, it, one of the things that you mentioned before, and I, I'd like to kind of caution everybody on as well is um, once you start working on your own and kind of being an entrepreneur, um, by all means, it could be gangbusters, but a lot of the times you're going to have to put your time in like just years of mm -hmm. sacrificing and being coming better at your business and um, setting up systems and all that stuff. And um, it's not an instant glamorous um, transition. Uh, it, it's some of the hardest transition that I've faced is making that transition from a uh, bartender, bar manager to an entrepreneur. Um, and it's not for mm -hmm. everybody. It's absolutely um, not for everybody. I've never worked so hard in my life um, as <laughs> I have been as an entrepreneur. And yeah. I mean, I've, I've pulled doubles during the worst parts of the year and that sucked, but I work twice as hard easily um, owning your own business because there's always things you can work on. Oh, uh, yeah. There's always yeah. things you can do. So um, yeah. I, I totally feel you on that one. Yeah. So I definitely think that like my, I mean, my advice would really be to kind of, oh, it's so cliche, but to like work smarter, not harder, like mm -hmm. really think about the scalability of all of your decisions. Sure. Um, but then also to, what, you know, a little bit what we touched on earlier is that whole like idea of lifestyle. Like, what do you want your life to look like? Right. You know, um, like, I don't make a living off my syrup company, but I have a lifestyle that I really enjoy. I always mm -hmm. wanted the kind of job where I get to travel. And now I have that. I right. travel to, you know, like, uh, like, for example, the distributor I work with in Chicago, um, every September they do a portfolio tasting event. So I go to Chicago every September. It's a gorgeous time to be in Chicago. And I always stay for a couple extra days so I can go to the museums and I can check out parts of the city that I've never done before because mm -hmm. I can. Now right. the trip, you know, the trip is, is a write-off. So it's like, I, I am, I get to do this kind of travel now and right. I love it. So I like, you know, I go out to eat a lot. I go mostly to visit customers or to see new customers or to hand out samples or, you know, talk to the bartenders about what's going on there. Um, so that's also a business expense. But, sure. you know, the thing is, I love going out to eat. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so it's about that. Li it's about like, what kind of life do I want? And finding yeah. a way to make that, like to incorporate that, that it's more, mm -hmm. it's more important to me to not have to do my own bookkeeping and i'm fine making less money if i don't have to do my own bookkeeping sure because i hate it so much <laughs> i hate it so much you know? it's, it's kind of the worst thing in the world really oh my uh, god for me as well <laughs> <laughs> but you know you find someone who totally digs it and that's right. great yeah like you know no nah, it's very cool very good advice um, so I've taken up a ton of your time and I cannot That's thank you right, enough. All right. Um, but, uh, is there anything you're excited about in the future? Anything you'd like to promote? Um, uh, anything um, that, um, you're working on that, uh, that you'd like to share? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, um, like I said, I'm, I'm, I signed a lease on a bar space in, in uptown Oakland, which I'm really excited about. So I'll get to have my own bar for the first time ever. Um, that's very exciting. So we're, uh, we're fundraising now, finding investors, which, mm-hmm. you know, all, like really like every business, every step is like, wow, I've never done this before. Let me figure this out. You know, lease negotiations took eight months. And many sure. thousands of dollars to a real estate attorney. I did not know that's what it took. Now I know. Cool. Right. Okay. Now I can plan for that for the next bar. You know, things like that. Mm-hmm. I love it. I, I just love. I love learning all these new processes and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I'm very excited about that. Very I'm cool. making well, a bar um, like no one yeah. has seen before. No so excited. Well, like this. just like the bar program you ran over, uh, you're running over at uh, Interval. Um, is pretty unique. Um, you know, Thank I've been you. kind of paying attention and, um, you know, just the grand idea that you have um, around that particular bar is, is pretty different um, than you see from any bar that I've ever seen. So, uh, no, thank I'm you. I was honestly, about it was really, uh, it was, I'm very, very lucky that this organization took a chance on me because I hadn't mm-hmm. executed my own program before. Um, but yeah, like I said, they, they say that. I own extinct cocktails and it's a nonprofit organization based on long-term thinking. So it was a good yeah. fit. Um, but I don't know that, and that other, that another organization would have let me do this kind of outre menu that I did there. And I'm really, really grateful that they, that they, they let me do this weird thing, you know? Yeah. yeah. And I love it. It's really cool. Very cool. So, um, is there any other place that people can, um, reach out to you, follow you, Facebook, social media, um, get in contact with you for uh, for dropping some cash on you for uh, for a new bar. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. If you're interested in investing, um, reach out to me directly. Uh, it's it's actually really fun, like because because um, I used to be a woodworker. Um, mm-hmm. uh, I I've been hand making all of the prospectuses for the potential oh, investors, what? and I belong to um, tech shop in the city in San Francisco. Um, and like laser cutting these these wooden basically these books and making these things so um and it's it's how i'm going to be making the menus for for the bar itself so it's kind of wow. like a preview of what the menu is going to look like um really really fun it's been super enjoyable so yeah i mean uh my website is just smallhandfoods.com singular hand mm-hmm. plural foods uh, my email address is just j at smallhandfoods.com um I've got face. I've got my own personal Facebook page, which is largely business related, anyways. And then I also have a Small Hand Foods um, Facebook page. Uh, Twitter is Small Hand Foods, and Instagram is Jennifer Collio. So basically, mm-hmm. from, there's no other Jennifer Collios in the country. So if you find if you just find that, you can find me somehow. Great, and uh, we'll put links to the and to all your uh, social media in the show notes. Um, awesome. But once again, thank you so much, and definitely appreciate. Uh, all your time and um we'll talk again soon hopefully and uh can't wait to uh to hear about more about your bar thank you thank you absolutely my pleasure thank you for making it all the way to the end of this podcast i know it's a little bit longer than our usual podcasts are um, but i hope that you agree that it's definitely worth it um she just had so much experience and insight and uh just really good advice for anybody that's kind of making their way through the bartending the career that I didn't want to get rid of any of it so I can't thank her enough um, for all the time she spent on this podcast on a similar note um, Jennifer's opening her own bar you might have heard that in the um, the podcast itself and she's currently looking to, or taking on investors as well so if you've ever wanted to invest in a bar or um, you know help her start her own bar definitely want to reach out to her we'll have some of her social media contacts in the show notes at mixologytalk.com slash 120. And uh, that kind of does it for our Bartender to Entrepreneur podcast series that we've been doing over the last year or so. Um, uh, in, I hope that you uh, enjoyed it. And uh, if you have, uh, definitely leave a note in the uh, iTunes or a review in iTunes for us. It will help us reach more people. We, we definitely appreciate it. So we'll have some more podcasts for you in the future. But until then, cheers, everyone. Never miss an episode by subscribing in iTunes or YouTube. And as always, check out the show notes by clicking on the right.